Except you have to be invited. You can't just become a member. Yeah. You know, you have to be nominated by two members in your branch, mm -hmm. and then, you you know, they, they all vote on it to see if you're admitted. Are you in the producer's branch? I'm in the producer's branch, yeah. Prior to that, I was in the writer's branch. Did, uh, did you know Marlon Brando at a certain point? Um, oh, you? yeah. I, I, he and I lived next door to each other in New York, and... Uh, I, when I was working for Stanley Kramer, uh, I did his, we did his first picture, The Nen, and uh, I took him on a coast-to-coast -coast publicity tour, and that was taken in Boston. That's Elvis dancing with my wife. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, is that in Double Trouble? That's how we met. She was the co-choreographer and danced with Elvis, and she's my partner, and she produced the Monty Python movie, the oh first one. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. And I got to New York, and I got a job as a publicist, working for David Selznick in New York. After working for Selznick, I worked briefly for RKO. Then I worked for Paramount. Then my mother knew a lady in a club in Chicago. <clears throat> they were fellow members. And her son was Carl Foreman, who was Stanley Kramer and George Glass's partner. And I moved out to California to work for Stanley Kramer. Were you happy doing publicity, or were you always sort of thinking, I really want to be a producer, and I really want to develop No, it's, it's something that just happened. I, I, in other words, when I was in publicity, I originally thought I'd stay in the music business. Mm. And then I just drifted into the publicity business, and I started writing scripts. And I remember I wrote a script called Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves or something, and I got an agent named Bernie Sindel, lovely guy, and then he introduced me to one of his clients named Joe Himes. She had written Double Trouble. It didn't have the name Double Trouble. I forgot what the name was originally. And uh, I had just formed a partnership with Irwin Winkler, and uh, we took a to MGM, and they wanted to do it as an Elvis Presley movie. Uh, so after Double Trouble, um, were you prepared with Point Blank, or was that a, was that a project that sort of came No, I'll tell you, you exactly what happened with Point Blank. Patricia, who was then, then working as our assistant, had a friend who was married to a film editor named David Newhouse, who had worked with John Frankenheimer on his big pictures. He and his brother Rafe had optioned this book and wrote a script. And she gave me the script, and our company bought the script, and we arranged, uh, we changed the title to Point Blank, and I went to Europe uh, with the script to see Lee Marvin, and gave him the script, and he agreed to do it, and then John Borman became the director, and the rest you know. Was, um, there is a, a famous story, I guess, um, from what I understand, Point Blank had been uh, rewritten after John Borman came on, and I guess Lee Marvin was a little... That's not true. First. No, that's not true? That is not true. The thing about Marvin being upset, we never had a problem in, in terms of the script. I know that was in a book or something like that. Yeah, I think that. Uh, in John Borman's book, maybe, or some book I had read, that was, uh, I guess it's been going around, or I don't know if that's... Well, you know, unless my memory is bad, I mean, you know, I don't remember any terrible things happening, but when you make a movie, you know everything is not going to be hunky-dory, and you're going to have, yeah. you know, one guy will say one thing, and one guy will say another, etc. The main thing was that the movie came out pretty well. Oh, yeah, it's very famous. I mean, I'll tell you what happened. It's interesting. We had a screening. Our first screening was in Chicago at the Chicago Theater, and it was great because I got my family to come and everything. And when the movie was over, there was stunned silence, and everybody walked out, and I said, Jesus, 
doesn't sound very promising. And as soon as they got to the lobby, they all started talking, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, and the picture worked. And what's incredible is that, you know, the movie opens and Lee Marvin is, uh, you essentially think that he's killed. He's your yeah, character. right. And then it suddenly, you know, it progresses and then sure. you see he's alive and he's seeking revenge. It's a really kind of innovative start to a film that's very unique. I mean, I'm sure that was, was that ever a, a contentious issue with any studio executives? No, not at all. No, never. It never came up. And we were very fortunate that we had not only a very good art director, but we also had an excellent cinematographer, Phil Lathrop. So oh, no, it worked, and Johnny Mandel did a really interesting score. Yeah, very just... unusual for him. Yeah, that score. Yeah, mm. very unique the way even the production design, where there's a lot of primary colors, and it's yes. just a very yeah, that's unique Borman. film. Yeah. Yeah. That's Borman. Borman's a highly talented person, and don't forget, this was only after he had done one movie, Catch Me If You Can, with the Dave Clark with the Dave Five. Clark Five. Yeah. Oh wow. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it was just um, because it could have just been like a, a typical genre game. Yeah, movie exactly. It turned into something that was just really unique. It's, from what I understand, the first movie to have been shot on Alcatraz. Yes. It was. How and did I, that come about? That I'll him. tell you exactly. Yeah. Jack Valente was the head of the Motion Picture Association. I contacted him and... He said he would see what he could do, and I got a call, and he had just come from a meeting at the White House with Lyndon Johnson, and he said, I called to tell you you got permission to shoot. It's the first movie you ever shot at Alcatraz. I was going to do a picture for Paramount with Robert Redford, and we had breakfast. He and I, Sylvia and Arzano, the director. Oh, is that for Blue? This was for Blue. Yeah. We had breakfast at the Beverly Wilshire for three hours. I had to go to New York. I finally couldn't sit anymore. And by the time I got to New York, uh, I went in to see Charlie Bluthorn, who was the head of Paramount, and Mar Marty Davis, who was the president of Paramount, said, uh, your picture's in deep trouble. Redford just walked. And Charlie Boone says, well, let's worry about that later. Let's go to lunch, which I thought was very classy. And we were looking, to, we needed somebody to play an American, you know, a, a cowboy of Spanish descent, but doesn't look Spanish, blue, hair, blue eyes, blonde hair. And Warren Beatty wasn't available. And we got Terrence Stamp. And this, you know, and I mean... That's how these things happen. And Terrence Stamp was very believable. And then also what was interesting about, um, about Blue, from what I read, is that there was also um, another film in, in tandem with Blue called Fade In. At the same about, time. Like, behind the scenes. Uh, yeah, I don't know what happened. Oh, I'll tell you exactly what happened. My then assistant, now wife, Patricia Casey, we were uh, l looking for locations with location manager and the production manager in Utah. When we were before we started Blue, I don't know what happened, but we had an idea there'd be a movie there. We we went to first to Mart Crowley, who at the time had been the secretary to Natalie Wood. Mart Crowley later wrote uh, the Boys in the the Band. Boys in the band. He wrote the first screenplay for it, for Fade In, and what Fade In was, was while we were shooting Blue, we used Blue like a location, and Fade In was Barbara Loden, who was then married to Elia Kazan, and Burt Reynolds was the guy. And so it was the only time in Paramount, there's a thing in Variety in my bedroom, I'll show you later. It's just the first time in screen history two movies were made at the same time. Wow. And it was, it was interesting because in Fade In, it was the story of an editor yes. putting together the yes. movie. I, I remember there putting certain, together Blue. There were shots of Terrence Stamp from yeah. Blue, and it was sort of intermingling yes. two realities almost. Yes. Like making the movie. And yes. 
So you wrote the Destructors and also produced that, and that was with Michael Caine, uh, yeah. Anthony Quinn. Yeah. Um, well, that was no. The original title in Europe was the Marseille Contract, and um, we uh, we made the picture for Warner Brothers, and we arranged for. American distribution vis-a-vis -vis AIP, and we're both saddened by they changed the titles of the Destructors. You had written um, the class of Miss McMichael. Yeah, that uh, was Glenda Jackson, and then that was a book. It was based on a book by Sandy Hudson. We gave Glenda the book, and she immediately committed to do it. I mean, you know, and she's a two-time Academy Award winner. Yeah, Michael Murphy of the you know was the in our movie, and Oliver Reed. Oh, a great story. <laughs> Patricia and I are invited to Oliver Reed's house in Dorking for the weekend. We were invited to dinner, and we brought along Sylvia Narzano and a friend of his. And when we were go as soon as we get to the house, we knock on the door, come in, the bloody door's open, and it's Alan... And he's wearing a opera, you know, one of those dickies with a bow tie and his bare chest, and he falls down the stairs. <laughs> now his brother is there with his sister, with his wife, and he and the wife get into an argument. They go into the den. Oh, and before this happened, we brought him a book. We said, we knew you were interested in whatever the book was about. He said, I don't need your bloody book. And he threw the book, and he must have walked out about 4,000 pounds worth of priceless glasses. You know? Oh, my goodness. Now we're sitting at the table, and he's serving us turkey by sticking his hand in the turkey and throwing the gravy. Then he grabs my wife and takes her into the living room to show the her something. Room. The dining his, room. His girlfriend wouldn't let him, she wouldn't cook for him, so he had to improvise in the hallway this table. Oh and he was angry, so he wanted to show me the thing. But he's showing the carving on the table, and he passes out because he's always drunk. And he's on my back. So I push him off, he hits his head on the fireplace, so I wait and wait. You he just thought you was so dead. So I go and I think I've killed him. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and then he winds up coming back in like nothing happened, and then he goes and gets a gun. Uh. <laughs> and, and he then chases. His daughter comes by and he chases his little daughter with a knife, and oh Wynn goodness. Wells, who is the boyfriend of Sylvia Norenzano, he and I both run to the bathroom and lock ourselves in because it's on the ground floor. Right. We're both trying to get out the window. He's already in my car trying to leave. <laughs> oh my gosh. We, we were going for the weekend. We got, we got back the... in, and there's Michael Murphy. He says, what are you doing back so soon? We said, don't ask. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, no. So on the Monday, we're back shooting, and Oliver, I'm talking to Glenda, and Oliver kind of comes over, and he says, I guess you'll never work with me again. I said, no, I'll, I'll work with you. I'll never eat with you again. <laughs> <laughs> How would you define a producer, uh, especially your type of producer who develops material? Is there anything that you feel is your essential job on a movie? or? Well, I think my essential job on the movie is to make sure the movie's going well and to leave people alone mm -hmm. and don't look into the camera. I think in all the years I was a producer, the only time I looked through a lens was uh, when the guy said they're photographing us in the Marseille contract. That's not my function. It's the function of the director and the cameraman. It's the function to choose wisely. Yeah. 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 And if you choose wisely, then you, you have no problem. And to keep problems. an eye on the financing. <laughs> the monies, that's the main thing. You know what I mean? Because there is a price to pay for making movies. And, you know, some you get in deferment, some you get regular salary. And if you let it go, you make nothing. And it's it's the only way of making a living. I was lucky that I could write movies for other people. So I didn't have to make 300 movies. You know, you do the best you can, and sometimes you don't. Listen, we've had movies, I'm not going to say what were, whom were. Some of the actors were missing three and four days. 
didn't turn up. Do you call agents, managers? Yes. And what good does it do? Are you kidding? We when we were making a picture in a famous city, we had just checked into a great hotel, and the manager called me, and he said, I want you out of my hotel at once. I said, why? He because so-and-so was urinating in a potted plant in the lobby. Mm -hmm. And it should be nameless who so-and-so was. <laughs> you know what I mean? But these things do happen, and you try to... Because what are you going to do, tell the guy off? Yeah. You can't. So you just do the best you can. And is there a, a project from your career or producing or publicity that you're most proud of no. that uh, stands out? No. I just like working, you know, like doing things. You know, everything is different. You can't just hold on to something and say, oh boy, because it's not you doing it. I didn't do it. I mean, when, you know, uh, uh, when we did Point Blank, it was uh, uh, John Borman, it was Erwin Winkler, it was Robert Chardoff, you know, etc. You know, when you make a movie, you, there are people all doing things. You know, it's not I did or I what. Please. Yeah. You know. In the final analysis, it's the director. Yeah. And we know that. And that's important. If you've got a good script and you've got a good director, you're off to the races. What has been your favorite occupation since you've done so much? You know, do you have a favorite? Being married to Patricia oh. Casey. Uh, oh, that's, that's so... my favorite occupation. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. I mean, no, because when you think of all of the things out of left field she brought into my life, it's extraordinary. There would have been no point blank without her, you know, etc. Same thing with Double Trouble. I mean, my God. I mean, no. I mean, she's just a very bright, you know, and we fight like hell at times, but she's <laughs> terrific. <laughs>